it's clear at this moment that Lynn is much quicker, but again, you saw he can get up there, but overtaking is very difficult. In 71, comes 71 in. so it's out of the way of the battle for the lead, and who comes in behind it? Oh, that's Julian Andlauer in the Porsche. So there's the no, Red River Sport Aston. car. It's an Aston, is it? Is it the Aston? They've brought in Lynn early. Now, have they brought in Lynn early to try to get some clear space to jump him in with an undercut in the pit stop? Because he's much, much quicker at this moment in time. Could well be. They've also stopped the Dane train. Nicky Team takes over from Marco Sorensen. Porsche, the Porsche pointing out that the Aston Martin's lap time is quicker than anybody managed in qualifying. Mind you, it is 15 degrees cooler. Yep, but also what he'll do now by stopping a little bit early is that he'll be able to take on less fuel. So his fueling time is going to be less, as well as the fact that he's got uh, he's got basically two laps to get it on the tyre while all of the action is going on with Collado trying to do two more laps on a used double stint tyre. And this 71 car has just changed drivers, yep. so it's going oh. to take tyres, so he'll be out the way as well. May I apologise, Lynn's actually done 14 laps, so it is a full, full stint on that. All right, OK. So off he goes. And Davide Rigon handed over to whom? Regular partner Miguel Molina, I guess, because didn't Sandberg hand over to yep. Davide Rigon Correct. last time round? Yeah. yeah, not last time round, but last change. Correct. So unless Birdie's getting no sleep, And of course, this car out of sequence because it had that left front damper, uh, right front damper collapse that led to a left rear puncture. 26 is in, fourth, fifth place for G Drive. Mikkel Jensen receives service. One minute stop and go penalty for 62 for a slow zone infringement. Well, they're taking a while to get all these penalties through, aren't they? 62, Johnny Molem, Red River Sport Ferrari. And Johnny's not done too well in keeping his nose clean in this race. G-Drive car goes through those RFID boards, it passed which are scanners that read the barcodes, the, the, rather the chips in each of the tyres on each of the cars, so that you don't have to do it manually, checking which tyres are fitted to which cars, each have a unique barcode, so not only does it tell the officials what tyres compound and so on are on the car but actually that they are tires for that car and you're not just throwing new tires that were destined for the sister car onto it alex brundle at the wheel of 32 he's dropped down to third place with this stop because a new fastest lap for anthony davidson in the 38 jota sport car as he moves through into second place three minute 30.610 Really? Is that the fastest LMP2 lap so far? Mm, 29.6 might be. Wow. That's very quick. Fastest lap for Cetilar, Giorgio Senna Giotto. Fastest lap this lap for Edex Sport 17 car from Patrick Pile, the new boy, not just to the team, but to prototype racing. So three LMP2 cars setting the fastest lap of the race on this last lap. Jan Magnussen for JMW on two green sectors on this lap. This is the witching hour, isn't it? Tom Blomqvist on a green run as well. So to Michelle Gatting in the Iron Dames car. So cool air, cool track temperatures. There's Davide Regon debriefing with the crew. The rain has not arrived, has it? Oh, don't. Don't start all that yet. <laughs> Let's hear from the Jota Sport car and Davidson, the quickest P2 car on track at the moment. Again, you can see on his steering wheel there, flashing away at the bottom of the display, the warning that he must stop this time round. The team confirming that bingo fuel alarm. And on that last stint, great times, he's in, because he's averaged a 32.718 in comparison to De Resta, leading the race with a 33.620. Admittedly, 
slightly different on the tyre strategy, but still very strong stint. One thing, Jamie, remember we're talking about tyre pressures with this car and with Anthony Davidson earlier on, that at two bar all round, yeah. they were at two bar front, 2.1 front, I think, and 1.8 rear, where he had the imbalance and understeer. Yeah, it's, now it's two it, bar all round. Yeah, it's quite high, isn't it? But uh, the car seems fast. More news and not good for the 92 Porsche GT car. Kevin Estra just leaving the pits in that car, which is eighth in GTE Pro, but 47th overall. So it is last but four of the running cars. That car had to change a front left because of a slow puncture. Talk about kicking them while they're down. Every bit of news almost that comes in from Porsche is bad news for the 90, uh, 92 car. Flying into the pit lane comes the 38 car. And then down to speed for the 60 kilometer an hour line. There it is. Number seven is considerably faster, I think, on average than uh, the number eight Toyota at the moment. Driver change as the 22 car spews out a Paul de Resta and takes on a Felipe Albuquerque. So I should quite back. call a pit stop of that sort of swift nature spews out. But <laughs> <laughs> Threw him quite a long way out. Can't see him now. Yes, he has been disco. Ooh. Oh, 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 oh. Not... car's gone down on the jacks and they couldn't get the tire off. Now they've got to get it back up again. In a, in a, oh, and that left rear again in a battle this tight. That is our LMP2 leader, or was. Here comes the 30, uh, uh, 32 yep. car. Yeah, that's Alec Brundle. Don't forget, 22 had the lead. 32 has the lead now. And United after Alex. Autosport, one, two, and Alex stopped a lap ago, so he doesn't know us to stop. Yeah, and Alex is also then going to hand over to Job van Oetert as well after that, whereas uh, after Felipe, it goes to Phil Hansen. So they're slightly out on their stops relation to their silver driver, if you wish. But uh, in reality, I don't think they've got a weak driver lineup in any no. way. No. They, they are fully loaded, United, aren't they? Whichever car you look at when you're looking at them in LMP2 or LMP3, you know, it, it's it's like Carlin in F3 or like Paul Stewart Racing, you know, back in the day. Good teams attract good drivers. And they go out and they find good drivers. And that was always Jackie Stewart's plan, to have a sponsorship package so they could go and get the best drivers and be the best team. And they still hired Alan McNish and Jamie Campbell-Walter. Can you imagine? But that's the way it works, you know? United are the same. They've positioned themselves really well. They've worked really hard. And they've got classic Whoa. driver lineups. And look at this, the Jota Sport car. And Davidson taking no prisoners. Oh, just catching that Porsche at entire. Oh, that's the TF Sport Aston, isn't it? It yep, is. Yep. Catching him at entirely the wrong position. This is a leader, James Collado, into the pits, getting out of the car. Gives the camera a long sideways look. Not yeah. sure why. Very polite. Alessandro Pierre Guidi gets back in. His uh, gesticulations are long since gone. 97 is coming into the Ford chicane now. So the. That is the Aston Martin of Alex Lynn. So on will the, the undercut stint. work? Where we go. This is going to be close. Yes, Lynn has the lead of the race. So he goes through, and the Ferrari now sets off with fresh tyres, a fresh driver, and a highly motivated Italian will be trying to chase down Alexander Lynn. Don't forget the last time Alessandro, well, the first time Alessandro Pierre Guidi brought the car into the pits, there was lots of arm flapping because they went from first to third with a muffed pit stop. This time they are, have gone from first to second. 
Stop for Toyota Gazoo Racing, the race leader, Brendan Hartley. That looked like a tyre change as well. I shall request confirmation. Gravel is on the circuit at the entry to Porsche. Some gravel there, I'm not sure why. Well, because somebody's dragged it back on from having gone off. Yeah, but who, I think, was <laughs> yeah. probably my point. <laughs> yes. Driver change for Red River Sports. Charlie Hollings taking over from Johnny Molum. Here's our LMP1 lineup. One, two, three for Toyota and Rebellion. With a Rebellion number one car a lap ahead of Rebellion number three. The number seven Toyota delayed, still three laps behind Roman Dumas in the number three Rebellion. Imminent pit stop for the number 91 Porsche, and it will see a driver change from Jimmy Bruni to Richard Leitz. That car is chasing the third place Aston Martin of Nicky Team, but it is two thirds of a lap back over two and a quarter minutes behind. Not Porsche's weekend, this. And the rain for which they had been devoutly hoping has not helped them yet. Charlie Eastwood has been uh, slightly reeled in again now by uh, Farfus. 4.8 seconds the gap. Whoa! Oh, that's the gravel. That's the big high speed lose. 62. 82. Yeah. And that is the Red River Sport Ferrari. Was that Johnny and he's in lap? Uh, or Charlie Hollings on his outlap, I'm not sure. Oh, somebody else has gone off as well. That's the uh, Inter Europol car going round the roundabout at Mulsanne. This is the second time we've seen a car going round the roundabout because in the morning warm up, the uh, Nicky team did that in the Dane train Aston Martin. Well, rather than try and make it round the right-hander when you get in too hot, the option there to go left of the gravel trap and around the roundabout is definitely the option if you can make it. I think that was Charlie Hollings on his outlap. It may well have been. last lap was a 6.27. Sorry, I didn't understand a word of that one either. How do drivers ever understand radio messages? Is it clearer for them? Yeah, but this is, I've got to say that it's not extremely clear at the moment coming through for us, but it's much, much clearer when you're in the car. It would need uh, to be. I, I assume that most of the time you sort of know what the engineer is going to be talking to you about anyway, but... Well, in theory, yes, but sometimes no. <laughs> uh, but there he was talking about, uh, it was a bit of information about boosting less out of turn seven. And that's boosting with the hybrid system. So two stints in, Brendan Hartley, the race leader, with fresh tyres all round, still smoking from okay. the back of the car. And, and uh, that's more than earlier. I'm not, I'm not loving that in a big way. It's been doing it almost all race. I reckon they're getting another turbo ready. Well, you don't wish that on anybody, but well, actually, it doesn't when it, when look... It, but when Good. a turbo starts to go, it blows white smoke, doesn't it? Well, when a turbo goes, it pole. just goes. They, they don't sort of leak a bit. It's like no. a head gasket. It doesn't blow a bit. And that, that, it's, that's more oil, isn't it? It's like overflow oil. It's been doing it all race, but it's, that was definitely the worst I've seen it. It looks more like rub of something. It's just trailing a little wisp, and it, doesn't, it hasn't slowed them down in any way. No. He's fresh out of the pits, brand new tyres. Up to speed, 209 laps in the books. And at the moment, we are on, if there is not cataclysmic failure and shed loads of rain, for a record distance, I believe. Over 11 hours now, raced. 
In the 24 hours of Le Mans, Toyota leading in LMP1, United Autosports in LMP2, Aston Martin in GTE Pro and in GTE Am. It could be double sieg for Aston Martin here, not necessarily for AMR. TF Sports leading in the AM class with Charlie Eastwood, but the AMR car of Agosto Farfus is in second place. So Toyota with a one lap lead over Rebellion. That's not a lot. Somebody rewinding tape live on air. Didn't think that happened anymore with electronics. Very strange noise. Blue lights flashing up ahead as the Toyota comes steaming up behind more slow traffic. It, is that part of the rhythm, guys, when you're driving a prototype and you've got slower cars all the time? They're, they're, you're always catching people in a different place, but do you just kind of get into your rhythm on the track and just deal with them as another little hazard? The traffic becomes easier because, you know, we've not had a safety car or anything recently, so they get a bit more spread out. You, you also get into your rhythm with traffic, not just your driving the lap, the line, the corners. You also, you just figure it out. It's easier, it's more natural. And also, I think the, the guys you're overtaking, they've become more used to being overtaken. So everything's a bit more fluid for everyone. And uh, yeah, it's just easier, I think. Kamu Kobayashi in the number seven car that led nearly half this race, more than 11 hours in front. And then a turbo failure dropped them out of the lead, out of second, out of third. They are now six laps behind the race leader, their teammates in the number eight car. And that's how much each of the drivers has done. Saw Jose Maria Lopez in the back of the garage, helmeted, suited and booted. Having a bit of a stretch and a limber up. And this car, 10 laps in on its tyres. And it should be pitting this time round. Will Kamui Kobayashi stay in, though? With only one run on those tyres, you think perhaps he might. Maybe the team can enlighten us. Driver change, OK. Well, those laps have only done one stint, Alan, so are they going to be thrown away and kept for, or kept for later? And is Pachito going to get a new set of tyres? Uh, I don't know. No. We'll have to wait and see when he does come into the pits, but <laughs> yeah. he's done 11 laps, so it is a full stint since they had the turbo change. And uh, as you see, Jose Maria Lopez, Pachito is uh, ready to get in. Looks like there's a set of tyres there, though. He would have. Did he already do three stints before? He's done. Yes, he's done the total of three stints plus the hold for the turbo change. But yeah. these tyres had ten laps on them, according to that graphic. Ooh, number eight Toyota. Little replay of the last lap round. It, it doesn't oh. look any better when you see it again, does it? No. no. Now, if you're in the car behind, I wonder what you would be smelling. Would you be smelling brake? Would you be smelling no, it's tire? Not brakes. Would you be spelling transmission? I mean, they all smell very, very different, don't they? Number seven, Toyota. Toyota always at pit in. The position favored by Jean Tot in the Peugeot days as well. Jose Maria Lopez slips into the seat vacated by Kamui Kobayashi. Now, he may well have been having a little rest. They need to be alerted to the fact that they were no longer the race leaders. Here is a direct rival, the second-placed rebellion. Gustavo Menezes brings the car into the pits. The mechanics there, checking the, the brake wear. Driver change. Not sure at rebellion. Wasn't sure that was still Gus's helmet in the car, but it may have been. We'll see in a few seconds when he pops out the end of the pit lane, then the driver ID comes up on our display here, and Gustavo Menezes looks like he's still in the car. Yeah, I think he is. He stays in. Third stint yep. for Gus. Uh, yep, uh, fourth, actually. Fourth. This will be yep. the fourth stint. Okay. 
So Bruno Senna did four before him and uh, Gustavo Menezes is going on to his fourth and I presume his final stint before switching over. Well, and let's go and listen to Gustavo Menezes in uh, the number one rebellion. Do not smash the brakes hard. So, but that well, was him, yeah. I'll do my best not to smash yeah. them, but I didn't hear... Adding oil, it sounded like to me, which is a strange response to that particular statement. But basically, I think, uh, Gustavo, if you don't hit the brakes hard, you don't put the load onto the front of the tyre, which then means the front of the car doesn't react quite as well, which means you get a push and an understeer and lap time drops off. And so he needs to try and find a rhythm where he's still saving the brakes, but he's getting the load and grip onto the front of the tyre to turn the car, to keep the momentum, to keep the performance up. Because at the moment, they're second in the race, and it's a clear lap behind the Toyota as we see the 62 Ferrari going off again at Mulsanne Corner. And uh, the 82 this occasion, apologies. And uh, in that respect, it is a very delicate balance for Gustavo Menezes because they want to try to be there if the number eight car, which is leading at the moment, has any problem. But on the other side, he doesn't want to risk very much because he's got a secure, strong second place. Now, that was Sebastian Bourdais in the Risi Competizione Ferrari. And it makes me wonder, actually, the last time we saw a red Ferrari off, whether it was 62 or 82. But Bourdais running deep at Mulsanne Corner. And instead of going round the roundabout, he opted for the gravel trap. Not necessarily always a great option. Well, driver changes getting ready as well at Dempsey Proton. And our Thai driver, Vitikorn Ithrapasuvac, is getting ready to take over from Julian Andlauer. Andlauer coming to the end of a long run in the 99 car. Top eight position for them. The car behind them, JMW's Ferrari. Jan Magnussen has just left the pits. Jan's been in there since about Wednesday oh. afternoon. Oh. oh! And Racing Team Netherlands and WeatherTech are off together. And that is Marshall's post six. That is at... Tetra Rouge. Tetra, Tetra Rouge. Rouge. So I would presume there that uh, the Racing Team Netherlands has gone down the inside, coming into Tetra Rouge, and it's tried to be... No, oh! Yeah. Tried yep. to follow through, and the WeatherTech car only saw one. Yep. And uh, turned in on him blinded by the yep. first set of lights and thought it was clear to take the corner. Pa. And Nick de Vries is off and in 83, that is Francois Peru, uh, hang on a minute. No, that's Tony Villander. Yeah. 63, sorry, yeah, Tony me, Villander. That's, that's Nick's error. Nick didn't need to do that. Well, again, trying to make up time and chase down Patrick Pile. And that is on the exit of Tetra Rouge. At 3.53. Double yellows there, and a slow zone will be put into operation to rescue both cars. They don't look badly damaged. Looks like the front end of both cars is still there. There's damage to the right rear of the WeatherTech Ferrari. I think Nick is, that's the tarmac bit there, isn't it? Yeah, he is. Actually yeah, on a, but on it's, a... I think he's got a bit of damage to the front there. And the thing is, if he reverses back, he'll reverse into the gravel. gravel yeah. And yeah. he's going to have to reverse back onto the circuit to be able to be cleanly out of it. Here we see it again, Jamie. On you go. Well, so the first prototype dives up the inside. Nick follows. And yeah, it's difficult because the Ferrari, he just sees the bright lights in his yep. mirror. And he's thinking, OK. The prototypes cleared me, and uh. Yeah, the first car through was the Eurasia Motorsport car, the other sort of goldy yellow and black car. And then, unfortunately, the door shut as Nick De Vries stuck his nose in. Well, De Vries oh, reverses he's back. Reversing. He doesn't want to try and now go forward. I don't think he's got the lock to make it round. Let's see. And oh. there's the problem. Never stop in a gravel trap. He got himself running and then dug himself in. 
And unfortunately, you can see the way the modesty panel there doesn't help. It sort of digs into the gravel as well. If he'd kept yeah. going backwards, of course, then he would have been in danger of reversing onto the circuit. So he's going to have to wait for the Manitou. And that means, unfortunately, that the WeatherTech Ferrari is going to have to wait much longer for the Manitou. Because first they need to clear this car, and then they can look at clearing him. It's like a 50-50 thing. Lawrence Pierce always used to say to me, if you crash with another car, it's your fault. If a car crashes into you, it's your fault. Yep. If you crash into another car, it's your fault. I'm not sure where the 50-50 comes in there. That's 100 nil. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but then, you know what he you know, was like. I but, do know exactly what Lawrence was like, yes. You know, and... Nick, you could say, yeah, it was 50-50, should the Ferrari be... I mean, Philander is a very experienced guy around here in a Ferrari. Yeah. Um, Nick, but, for me, you know, you could you could have just followed the Ferrari through, focused on your exit from Tet Rouge and got a good run. What do you lose? A couple of tenths, you know? Um, look at the display in front of the driver here. Full course yellow active, it says, for Felipe Albuquerque. And on the right-hand side, the RDS system, slow zone, 80 kph. And then when they get to the green flags, it'll go green. His dash will indicate that as well. And he is right behind 28, I think. That's the Edex Sport car, isn't it? And who's at the wheel of that? Paul-Luc Chatin. Little moment to think and stretch. And they will go through the slow zone. And then green flags after Tete Rouge and head off down the straight at speed. So Nick de Vries returned roughly to terra firma. We know he's got an engine. Oh, that'll do nicely. Oh, dear. And they're going to get the rear bodywork, the front bodywork. And uh, Henry the Hoover, I think, will possibly be pressed into service as well to make sure that and the underside of the car is free of gravel. It's a race that hasn't gone particularly well for Racing Team Netherlands. They've had a pretty decent run so far in the World Endurance Championship. But this race not being kind to them. And just looking actually what happened in the sister event for Fritz van Aert with the Tour de France because he's part of the team that was fighting for victory in the Tour de France and that slipped away from him today as well. Has it? As they go into the Champs-Élysées tomorrow, 59 seconds behind, having led gone into today. Wow. So, yeah, Fritz van Aert sponsoring that team as he does. He doesn't ride for that team, he just <laughs> drives for this team. <laughs> Mind you, I bet he could, well, possibly not, but uh, I'm sure he spends a lot of time on a bike. So back up to speed then, the battle for the lead in LMP2, 32-22 United Autosports, a full 1.6 seconds apart. We're with Alex Brundle, uh, with uh, Felipe Albuquerque rather, chasing Alex Brundle. That'll be that set of lights in front, Jamie. Well, I'm just looking at the tyre pressure. It's really interesting because they are running 1.75 to 1.8. And it's a big difference, isn't it, between the Michelin runner and the Goodyear runner mm. of, uh, we were on board with Davidson earlier, running 2.05 and 2 on the rear, and uh, it's a full sort of 175, I think that says, 171 even maybe, so quite a big difference in pressures there. Well, you know, the pressure is part of the construction rigidity of the tyre, mm. and it's also part of the damping of the car as well. And so it very much depends on the construction of the tyre and what the tyre requires and needs. And uh, that's just part of the whole makeup of it. So some of the tyres, as you know, Jamie, are designed to be a little bit, need that little bit more pressure to allow them to work in their actual overall working range. You know, the tyre tells you what it needs at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And you've just got to listen to it. Let's hear from our third place team, Joe to Sport. So, looks like both United are looking to pit. We will follow the leader here. We will follow the leader here. And that's because there's a slow zone, so any pit stop now will 
reduce your time losses due to that slow zone for the incident as both the Uniteds do pit and we expect then to see Anthony Davidson following. He's 15 seconds behind this battle right now. Yeah, a couple of cars have also done that. G-Drive have used the opportunity to swap in Jean-Eric Van to the fifth place, number 26 car. Dragon Speed have put Ben Hanley in 27. And just to note that the two uh, United cars are coming in line astern, but mm -hmm. the 32 pit is ahead of the 22. So as long as the 22 isn't much faster on the pit stop, they won't lose any time to each other or alternatively to Jota. Well, they have stopped at each other's box. No, they haven't. 32 oh, has stopped in their own one. Yes, you're right. And the G drive. That wasn't a G-Drive car coming in. That was the Edex Sport car, Patrick Pillay, that was following them down pit road. Dragon Speed also pitting oh. their 21 car, Juan Pablo Montoya. The United cars are off. There's the Jota Sport car behind. That is, again, the top three all stopping within sight of each other in LMP2. A little bit of confusion there with uh, the 22, the second car in the pit there being released. He was being pulled back to go around the 32, but the 32 then left, and so that kind of probably lost him that small bit of gap. It was half that going into the pit stop, and it's now a full second coming out. They both spent a minute and three seconds in the pits, and here is the WeatherTech Ferrari being returned to terra firma. It's yeah. a bumpy ride, though, that, isn't it, I'm front, afraid? That front splitter was getting a good hammering against the ground. Yeah. yeah. The reason it was uh, a shorter pit stop was because they didn't have to refuel as much because they had only done six and seven laps. But now both U uh, United cars are on exactly the same strategy. The Jota Sport car spent seven seconds longer in the pit lane. It took on more fuel. And tyres. Yep. Ah, OK. Roman Dumas. Just out of number three rebellion, Louis Delatraz, the rookie, is in in third place. Rebellion second and third after the turbo change for the number seven Toyota that led pretty much all of the first 12 hours of this race. And this full course yellow down around the Terre Rouge region to allow the rescue of the 29 Racing Team Netherlands car, Nick de Vries, who had contact with the WeatherTech Ferrari. WeatherTech Ferrari was being passed by the Eurasia car. He believed there was only one set of headlights behind him. They're so blinding, it must be impossible to tell. And then tried to make the corner. Nick de Vries was down the inside as well, following the Eurasia car through, made contact with the Ferrari, and they both went off stage left at Tert Rouge. Both ended up nosed into the barriers. De Vries with not a lot, it seemed, of damage. But there is definitely damage on the back of the WeatherTech car. So to Tony Vlander will be heading back to the pit lane without any doubt at all. Ten and a half hours, Mark, just under with 13 hours and 31 minutes completed of the 2020 Le Mans 24 hours. We're racing through the night in September for the second time ever in the history of the world's greatest endurance motor race. And a very tight battle for the lead of LMP2. You ride on board with the car in second place. And the car in the lead is just in front. As we go green again, they exit the slow zone. Back up to speed immediately. Alex okay. got a good start there. Yeah, Alex Brundle good... in front of us as we ride with Felipe Albuquerque. Third place to Jota Sport car, Antonio Felix da Costa, 22, 23 seconds behind. And it's these three that are on the lead lap in LMP2. A couple of safety cars after dark have split the field. Nick de Vries back at Racing Team Netherlands. And this is what happened. The Ferrari being passed by the Eurasia car successfully. De Vries went in, but by that time, the Ferrari driver was committed to turning through Teat Rouge. And unfortunately for both he and for De Vries, Tony Villander in the Ferrari getting caught there by the Racing Team Netherlands LMP2 car. So they will both be heading to the pits. De Vries was rescued from the gravel trap first. Villander has only just been put back on terra firma. 
So he will hopefully be making his way back to the pits as well. Slow zone still in effect for the next 30 seconds or so, then it will be rescinded and everybody will be back to full green track conditions. And that means that Vlander has left the area and is on his way back to the pits as we ride on board in this battle for supremacy in LMP2. It's been going on for a, a couple of hours between the United Auto Sports car. 22 has had the upper hand in 32, 32 over 22. And that's the way it is at the moment. Alex Brundle leading from Felipe Albuquerque and Antonio Felix da Costa. And this is Antonio, the newly crowned Formula E champion. Now, going by him, one of the LMP1 cars, so that reduces us to either one of the Toyotas or one of the Rebellions. Didn't quite spot which one it was as it went by. Antonio, one of four brothers. I think that was the number two, number one. Rebellion. Gustavo. Antonio's older brother, Duarte, also a racing driver. He's got another brother who's a top chef as well. Fairly talented family. Bits coming off the Racing Team Netherlands car. That will probably continue for a while. Alan Manish has abandoned us to go to his beat. And we have been joined by Peter Dumbreck. So, Peter. Good morning. Good morning. Is it? Oh, good grief it is. Four, four o'clock, five past four, Central European summertime. Peter Dumbreck, Jamie Campbell, Walter Martin Haven here. So, lots I to left, catch up on here. Yeah, I left four hours ago. I see there's been a Toyota issue for the number seven. Yes, they led nearly half the race and then a turbo failure. And the problems for the seatbelts of Antonio Felix da Costa, they clearly either didn't do up properly or have sprung open. And these multi point belts, the driver can't see the buckle, can't reach the buckle. And so he's had to come in because one of his belts has come undone. And he's obviously been on the radio to the Jota Sport team and has said, I need to box and get the seatbelt done. So he drops further behind the United Auto Sport duo that lead LMP2. That's fairly unusual, that. It is, and isn't it? Usually when it's click clunked, that's yeah. it, it's done. So obviously didn't quite get clunked. Yeah. But in fact, that was a double stint for him. So it's taken a while to work itself loose. He didn't get in at the last pit stop. He was already in the car. Having taken over from Anthony Davidson at the previous stop. So, yeah, the Toyota lost the lead, lost second, lost third, and is now six laps behind the leader after a nearly 30-minute stop to change the turbo on the right-hand bank of cylinders on its internal combustion engine. And that then cycled the number eight Toyota from a lap behind back into the lead. Number eight now leads by one lap from the number one Rebellion and a further lap back, make that a further two, no, a further lap back is the number three Rebellion. And this racing team Netherlands car is gonna take a bit of work to straighten out after its trip into the gravel and particularly after contact with the WeatherTech Ferrari. And just looking to see if the WeatherTech Ferrari is shown as in the pit lane. It's not. Has it been in the pit lane or not? Peter, you know how to work the, uh, the laptop. Just have a quick squeeze and see if 63 has made a stop in the last few minutes. There was the other car involved. It's been a really ding-dong battle at the head of LMP2 between the two United Auto Sports cars. Jota in third, Panis Racing in fourth. Well, there's our answer, the Tony Vlander yeah. coming back towards the pit. So we've saved you all that work. Right rear puncture. So he is going as slowly as he dares and as fast as he possibly can, which is a tough balance to strike, isn't it? Well, he clearly has lost his tyre there, which is a good thing. The carcass is gone. Yeah. It's not ripping the back of the car to bits. So, um, yeah, he's able to come back fairly quickly. 
It seems like a strange thing to say, doesn't it, that all the rubber has gone, and that's a good thing. On your road car, you probably wouldn't think so because you'd be looking at a new wheel, but you're right. It's the damage that all that flailing rubber and steel and to in be the fair, carcass can do. That's I, th the I think problem. there was a fair bit going on, and it's just ripped it to bits already. No, no, no. That was contact. That was already damaged in the gr when he was stationary in the gravel trap. Ah, okay. That was that was the hit from the racing team Netherlands car. On board with Pierre Rad for Senior Tech Alpine, and this car now up to ninth position. One of our expected front runners. They had a very early problem from Caen in nearby Normandy, just about an hour and a half north of Le Mans. So Pierrag chasing the car in front, which is not in front of us in, on the screen. Ben Hanley is in eighth position. Uh, for, I beg your pardon, though, he's chasing Nico Lapierre, who is in eighth position for Cool Racing. Ben Hanley is in seventh for Dragon Speed. The number 27 car is working its way very resolutely up the order. Remember, uh, Cool Racing, the number 42 car, also had a big issue early in the race. And uh, they've gradually worked their way up as well after that. You know, they were uh, almost last of the yep. P2 runners. And you know what, if you had an issue early on in P2, you did quite well at, uh, to have it early on because there have been so many issues in LMP2 at the moment. How many issues? Well, here's how many. The Edex Sport car number 28 of Paul Lafargue, you can see it there in 10th position. That car started last and a lap down on the entire field, including the LMP2 field and it is in 10th place in the LMP2 category. And its sister car is in 14th place, Jonathan Kennard in the number 17 car. Both cars were half destroyed in practice crashes on Thursday, so much so, in fact, that the 28 car had to have a new tub, a whole new chassis into which the engine gearbox and electronics and everything else, including the fuel cell, it was really a bear tub, were rebuilt on Friday. So the IDEX Sport team with both of their cars requiring major intervention surgery, and in fact a full quad bypass effectively for the 28 car, the more damaged of the two, is actually the one that's having a slightly better run through the field at the moment. I'd imagine they've got a group of pretty Tired mechanics and engineers done in that team right now. Yeah, they're counting their blessings that they're not having to set to every time the car comes in now, aren't they? Of course, there's still a very long way to go. In fact, there's a lot of darkness still to go. We're probably not even going to see the beginning of light in the sky for at least another two hours. Normally, it's 11 minutes past four. Central European summer time, we would be starting in the next 15 or 20 minutes in June to see the sky lightning. Don't expect that to happen for at least another two and a half hours. It's another thing that's a bit different this year, isn't it? You get a, a driver who will have done maybe a triple stint in the dark, getting back in the car and doing another Still dark. another yeah. triple stint in the dark. So. It's like winter, isn't it? You go home in the darkness and you go to work in the darkness. Hang on a minute. I've, I've just been to sleep. How come it's still night? Yeah. It's a funny old year in every way. There are some very tired EDEX sport mechanics. I did say earlier, there's not enough beer in Le Mans to reward them for all the work they've put in before the race even started. Rebuild work going on here on the rear end, that left rear corner, that's the one that made contact heavily with the WeatherTech Ferrari. Tony yep. Vlander taking Nick de Vries's name. Nick de Vries there in the background, in the black jacket, keeping warm, taking his name off the Christmas card list. Be a bent wishbone, won't it, or a, or a track mm -hmm. rod. Yeah. I was just outside and I stuck my head over the fence beside our booth here just to have a watch and uh, it still blows your mind when you see that uh, Toyota behind a GT car, how it just fires out of yeah. the corner. It's like it's coming off the deck of an aircraft carrier, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's some external... It, it's like a kid's toy, some external hand just whooshing it along much quicker than the engine note suggests it can possibly go. And it's the speed at which they go up the gears yeah. in the first sort of 100 metres. It's like... Bah, 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 bah. It's yeah. like, wow. Yeah. Pulling gears as fast as you can. Yeah, just hanging on to that thing must be a real job of work. So driver change here because Nick de Vries is in the back of the garage. So they setting Fritz van Aerd out. Or is that Renge van der Zander? Afraid my uh, racing team Netherlands helmet recognition is possibly not what it ought to be after all these races. But we saw Nick de Vries in the back of the garage a couple of minutes ago. So I'm not thinking it's him. See, the G-Drive mechanics as well. Both cars are run by TDS. So two cars in parallel garages with very different liveries, but everybody mucking in together. It is the same team, effectively, that runs them. But that's not Nick in the background, is it? He, there Might. was, I no, thought I think, it was I Nick Nick's beside him. Maybe Nick in is the in the car. There's problem, two problem, dark heads. Problem you have when you, when, when you have to replace a, a suspension part like this, here we see it again. Yeah, the Ferrari uh, just didn't see him, did he? No. Nick was only three laps into his first stint, so for sure it'll still be Nick that gets back in once they get that car fixed. Yeah. The weather tech. Oh, that's him coming home. That's quite a lot of damage, isn't it? Yeah, that's him leaving Arnage, isn't it? So that proves that it was. Uh, no, that damage is. Uh, yeah, so left, left rear, left of, rear of this car, right rear of the Ferrari, because he hit him from the inside. That's Fritz van Aerd. Oh, it's not. That's the team boss, actually, at the front of the garage. Problem with this is uh, when, you, when you're putting new track rods and wishbones on, it's the, these cars are obviously set up in a, a very fine way. Uh, they go on scales, and we call it a corner weight. And uh, you try to have the uh, corner weight of the car identical on all four corners for good weight distribution etc and uh, when you suddenly got to replace a whole corner on a car it's difficult for the team because they need to get the car back out there as soon as possible and of course they use these little spaces for the camber for the toes for everything um, but when you have to replace certain parts it's never going to be perfect Looking at our GTE AM leader, a couple of hours ago, we had two phenomenal battles going on between the United Autosports cars in LMP2 that were just half a second apart, and between two Aston Martins at the head of the GTE AM field that were also half a second apart. At that stage, it was Augusto Farfus in 98, and Charlie Eastwood in the number 90 car who caught and passed the Brazilian. And now Johnny Adam leads from Paul Dallalana, 90 TF Sport Aston, ahead of the 98 AMR car with the AF Corsa car in third place. Francois Perodo still at the wheel of that car. The previous winners in the AM class, Team Project One last year with the GDO Perfetti. He went on to win the World Championship. 77 Christian Reeds Dempsey Proton car. JMW won in 2017. Scuderia Corsa who are running the WeatherTech car this year. They won with their 26, uh, 62 car in 2016. So they've had a variety of different winners over the last few years. And of course, Johnny Adam won GTE Pro for Aston Martin 2017 in that classic last half hour battle with the Corvette. People might ask, why was he in GT Pro and now GT Am? He's, he's a factory driver for Aston Martin Racing. Yep. Uh, but he's been placed by Aston Martin as the pro in the GT Am car. You have to have a one bronze, one silver, and Johnny uh, will be uh, a platinum because he has won this race. And you automatically become a platinum once you are a factory driver. Interesting, the number 90 car, um, they're just alternating Johnny Adam and Charlie Eastwood all the way through the night. I can't see Sally Ulick anywhere on this board here in front of me, so yep. he's uh, not. He's choosing not to drive in the darkness, well, whereas Bo Dallalana yeah. is out, he's seven laps into his first stint in the darkness. 
eight seconds a lap slower than Johnny uh, at the moment, and the gap is now 50, some 50 odd seconds. Bit unfair the comparison. You've got the bronze versus the pro. So, of course, this will ebb and flow throughout the race. Uh, the pro pulling a, a big gap now, but then at, at a later stage they are holding back uh, in the um, 98 car to put the pros in a bit more towards the end of the race when yeah. uh, the AM will have to get back into the TF car which we're on board with now. So, so what's the minimum that we can the, the amateur needs to drive? Martin, yeah. do we know that? Six, Good question. Six hours, uh, I think. Graham and Alan know off the top of their heads. I can't remember exactly, I have to say. Francois Perrault do in from third place. Little telling moment on board there with Johnny Adam, the race leader in GTE Am, going past the pole sitting car, the number 61 car in seventh place in GTE Am. The Lusic Racing Ferrari is three laps off the class lead after a couple of excursions early in the race. Here is our GTE Pro class second place car. That is the AF Corsa Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Aston Martin's Alexander Lynn taking the lead. They did a short run and undercut the Ferrari by two laps to give Alex Lynn the lead of the race in the GTE Pro class. And the gap has come down to now two seconds. And Alessandro Pierre Guidi on what is potentially the fastest race lap for this car. Um, interestingly, in qualifying, that, that lap would have been deleted because he well and truly <laughs> used the track limits through yeah. the Porsche curbs. Wait for the delay. We'll get a message in a minute. Black and white flag. Well, it depends how many times he's abused the track limits there. Alex Lynn, early in this uh, in the, early in his previous stint on fresh tyres, set three new fastest laps in a row for the car, one of which, or in fact a couple of which, were quicker than anybody went in qualifying. So the Aston was flying, but it's getting towards the end of its tyre life in Alessandro Pierre Guidi. In the beginning of this stint, only nine laps into these tyres. So these cars should both do 14 lap stint. And Alexander Lynn for Aston Martin holding on in front. Our race leader in the pits again, Brendan Hartley, will begin at stint number... Th oh, no, he doesn't. Driver change. So that is not Brendan Hartley. That is Kazuki Nakajima, who takes over from the Kiwi. Brendan did a double stint then in his black nighttime helmet. Kaz Nakajima going with red and white, daytime or nighttime. Safety drive, it says, on the side of his helmet. Interesting, that, Peter. Do you not think... He, oh, I was going to say, he had a dark visor on and he had it down. I was like, that's <laughs> going to be interesting. <laughs> yes, you wonder why you'd bother with a dark visor unless yeah. he's thinking that he's going to be in long enough for daylight to come. Uh, yeah, for four stints for Brendan Hartley. Yeah. A double-double. And they, were, they changed tyres after each pair of stints. My, my little weather app here says sunrise 7.43. Yeah, that's official sunrise, but yeah. the light, the so sky six, will start to light at 6.45, yeah. 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock-ish. So we've still got another hour, two hours. Two. Two hours bit. probably of, of pitch black. Yeah. So equivalent of really sort of 2 a.m. rather than 4 a.m. in a normal Le Mans. And we talked about it a little bit earlier, you know, getting to midnight, getting to darkness, getting to the grid, getting to the start of the race, getting to your first fuel stop, all these little milestones you chip away. Getting to daylight is another big one. Now, of course, normally when you get to daylight, you think, yeah, we've nearly made it. It's the morning. There's at least another eight hours, often 10 hours, depending on when the race has started and when it's due to finish. Nick de Vries. less this weekend. Nick de Vries has stayed in that car. Yeah. He was, yeah, he'd only just started his stint. Yeah. yeah. Again, that, that team deciding not to run Fritz van Aert through the night. He hasn't been in the car for quite a while now, so they've been rotating the two pro drivers. Problem is, they keep having too many uh, incidents, don't they? They're down in 17th place. Yep. 
in LMP2. And, you know, to be honest, with a fairly good lineup uh, yeah. from the two pros. Just no luck, really. No. And, and of course, you know, again, actually, for all his speed, what happened in Hyperpole? Who was the LMP driver who binned it at the Porsche curves? It was Nick de Vries. He was yeah. on a very quick lap, but he didn't complete it. That uh, Ferrari was just off again. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that's a standard practice. We talked about it earlier on. You've got a bit more safety in the darkness. No one's watching quite so much. Everyone's a bit bleary eyed. Well, the, or the marshals just uh, having a kip. Well, you know, they're as exhausted as everybody else, even though they work in shifts like everybody else. The other thing that, that was pointed out early on is that the Ferrari hasn't got the front end under it that the Aston does. And, and, and maybe that's all still part of it, even though the Ferrari's tires are only 10 laps old and the Aston's are nearly 30 laps old, the Aston still seems to have enough just to stay in front. Last lap for Alexander Lin, 3.52.0, 3.51.7 for Alessandro Pierre Guidi, three tenths of a second over 13 kilometers. That sounds to me like a pretty even match, and yet Alex is on triple stint tires, and Alessandro is on first stint tires. 29.1 for Jean-Éric Verne. Uh, last lap, uh, I think that might be the fastest lap in LMP2. Wow. Well, Jeff in the G-Drive car chasing Nico Jama. He's nearly a minute behind the fourth place Panis Racing car. Again, the only time we mention Panis Racing is to say what position they're in and the fact that we've never mentioned them for any incident. So Not smoke down there. Someone's yeah. run away. 62 cars gone around, the Rev River Sport car. Taking the tyres with it. It has taken the tyres with it. So he's gone straight through and come backwards through the gravel trap. Charlie Hollings with not one. That's a second tyre stack there on the right-hand side, just glinting. So he's taken a lot of tyres out. I think that's his third spin. It's he's at least been his off second at off. Mulsan. The 82 Risi competition car went off at Mulsan. That was Sebastian Bordet. Yeah, who and went this one before. Through the gravel trap. Was his he outlap, got off I think. before. Look at that. He's taken twonked two piles of tyres out. That will be a local yellow. Mm, they're going to want them back, uh, taken back off the track. Yeah. And put back where they were as well. And that's going to take a lot of humping and huffing and puffing by the marshals. Those are not easy things to manoeuvre. Are we going to see a safety car? For I don't that? think so. You could do that under yellow, but. Yellow zone. Uh, yeah, slow zone. But how much damage does that do? I mean, it had all the lights at the front and all the lights at the back. So where's he twonked the tyres? With the door? Bit of debris there in the track. Tell you what, the next time somebody hits the barriers, we may well have a safety car just so the race director can do a lot of other clear up operation because they will have had messages in from Marshall's posts dotted around the track that they've got a bit of debris, they've got a lot of gravel and so on and so forth. There's a lot of uh, gravel and marbles at the uh, final chicane, actually. Yeah. Oh, there are everywhere, aren't there? There's been cars going off left, right and centre. Of course, it's so bone dry as well that when you go off on the grass and on the verges, you bring on lots of dirt and dust and leaves and muck and other stuff. It's a bit more like rally cross than racing in some of these corners. I must admit, I thought we would see some rain by now, but again, I've just checked my, my app, and it seems Jamie could be right here with his prediction of not at least not until daylight. Yeah, not until the moment we try and get our heads down, and then it'll rattle off the caravan roofs. Do you want me to give you the official time? Oh. When it's going to rain. Official time of rain. He's feeling positive now. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Even a bit cocky, to be fair. Mm. It, he's gone all Jonathan Agnew on us. Come on, then. Well, hang on. I can feel hedging going on here already. I think the sprinkles could start around about 10 o'clock. OK. Tomorrow morning. Just Race to give leader you in the pits. End of the third stint for Alex Lynn. That, that was a question aimed at you, Peter, because yes, you've got the st I'm, strategy I'm, just, I'm on that now. I'm on that now. Yeah. 97, all the way down there. He's only just woken up. He hasn't, woken up, has has he? Woken up, yeah. <laughs> he hasn't woken up, yeah. He hasn't woken up He's in the booth, but he's yet to wake up. I'm not sure I will wake up, to be so, honest. So, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, a four-hour sleep isn't really very much, is it? 
Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the 51 Ferrari takes the race lead. But don't forget that the Aston stopped two laps early. Driver change, Maxime Martin takes over. Yep, double stints from these drivers. Normally you do um, a bit more than a double. Normally in the night you do a triple. But uh, yeah, Alex Lynn out, double stint. Good stint, yeah. 3.52.6 average. But uh, Pierre Guidi behind 3.52.2. Average. So, um, yeah, don't forget, Alessandro is only in his first stint on those tyres, so that should drop as they wear. Yeah. So, Alex Lynn out. And maybe they're just rotating the drivers now with tyres. Double stint the tyres, double stint the drivers, keep of, the drivers of fresh. Course, um, yeah, they're not allowed to run Oof. more than two stints on these soft tyres, are they? Ah, uh, yes. So, that's why they're doing that. Yep. So if you have to change tyres, you may as well change drivers. Keep them fresh, keep them sharp. But on the downside, the driver doesn't get quite as much rest as you would like. Except then you know that that's the situation. So like us, instead of saying, you, you know, we're on every couple of hours, you take 